Parents and teachers, there are allusions to a couple of naughty words in this video. You may wish to consider reviewing it before sharing it with your family or your class. Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine. In this video we are going to have a look at a few more items from the collection of the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge. The Australian Opal Centre is building the world's greatest public collection of Australian opal, rare opalised fossils, opal related geological samples and opal from around the world. And what we're going to look at today falls into at least three of those categories. Lightning Ridge in northern New South Wales, Australia, produces a significant amount of fossil material, some of which is preserved in gem quality opal. Among the Lightning Ridge specimens that we've looked at on this channel in the past are things like the spectacular fossilised remains of dinosaurs like Lightning Claw, Weewarasaurus and Fostoria. And we've also looked at gorgeous opalised fossils like these incredible mussels, and these spectacular pieces of opalized prehistoric turtle shell. But today we're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and instead of looking at incredible dinosaur fossils and beautiful opal, we're going to have a look at coprolites, regurgitolites and consumerlites. Or if you prefer, poo, spew and undigested dinner. I stopped by the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge, but due to the current wave of the pandemic, I wasn't able to meet up with the paleontologists face to face. So instead, I spoke with Dr. Elizabeth Smith via teleconferencing and with Jenny Brammel via audio to discuss fossilised dung and puke. I apologise for the quality of the audio on the interview. Clearly there must have been some blockages in the internet pipes the day that we recorded this, but I have put up some subtitles just to make sure that everything's nice and clear. So this piece has been in the Australian Opal Centre's collection for about 13 years now, and it's been classified as a gastric pellet. So what, what is a gastric pellet? In this case, it might be fossilised gut content, or it might be regurgitant material that's been vomited out or it could be coprolytic coprolite material so again there's there's quite a few options there so we're looking at something that was probably either in the stomach of an animal when it died and became fossilized or it was vomited out by a creature and then ended up fossilized in isolation from the creature. There are a lot of unknowns about this piece which just makes it even more interesting. It was fascinating because of the uniformity in size of the little shards and they're also very thin the pieces and they're all sort of snugged in together as if they've been constricted in a tight place. When we look at the specimen what we're seeing is a stack of little shards of what is believed to be muscle shell all compressed together. On the other side of the piece are four tiny vertebrae from fish and there's a few other little bone fragments scattered around. So it's a it's a pretty amazing piece because it's it's combi combining two different biological organisms in the one little object. It really has a, a story to tell if we can if we can hear it. So we're kind of certain that what we're looking at is mussel shell fragments and fish bones all compressed into a tiny pellet. This thing's about the size of a 20 cent piece. But the real question is what kind of animal did this come from? Who ate and then threw up these mussels and fish. What else could it potentially be? What else was around at the time that might have been eating, you know, chomping up mm, little mussel shells and eating little bits of fish? No, it's always had turtle pellet on it. In terms of identification of the animal that, that caused it, again, that's, that's pretty speculative. The size of those shards, which might reflect the the line of a turtle jaw, the turtle bite. It's possible it could also be from a lungfish, which is a species that also feasted on mussels, but the general consensus so far is the way the shell fragments have been chomped suggests that they were probably chewed up and spat out by a turtle. Well, it's been concentrated in the gut. Think about a, the equivalent of a hairball. Yeah. Things that you, you eat, you can't digest. They'll collect in your stomach through different mechanisms. Owls that eat little mammals and lizards and things and all those bones and beetle shells and things collect together and you find them in pellets on the ground. But as with all of this material, there's still a lot to learn, a lot to explore, which is exciting. 
A couple of other things about the turtle gastric pellet, just to prove that the universe has a sense of humour, this little pellet of prehistoric turtle upchuck isn't just preserved in common opal, in which case it would have been grey, but it actually has play of colour with a little lavender sheen across the surface of the muscle shell shards. It's it really has to be the most beautiful vomit in the world. Not that I imagine there's a lot of contenders for that. Also, when items get catalogued into the collection of the Australian Opal Centre, they get a written description attached to them so that they can be identified in case they ever get separated from their storage containers or if they're put on display or something like that. It's a pretty standard museum practice. So the description card for this particular specimen gives us a recipe for prehistoric turtle vomit. It says, layered shards of mussel shell, four tiny fish vertebrae and other minute bones, cemented in fine-grained red claystone. Shell and bone fragments mauve. It's kind of like poetry, and if you ever wanted to mix up a batch of 100 million year old terrapin heave, then that's what you're gonna need to do that. But of course, vomit isn't the only thing that we're here to look at today. Largest rock, and I suppose copper is great for. There are a few potentially coprolytic items in the Australian Opal Centre's collection. A bit like the vomit specimen, coprolites suffer from being really difficult to positively identify, and even more so with discoveries at Lightning Ridge. In most fossil sites, coprolytic material is identified on the basis of inclusions of little plant scraps and tiny little pieces inside the material. Here we can't do that so often because often there's not a lot of internal texture in these pieces. Opalized fossils are often lacking in internal details because of the way that opal forms. Opal at Lightning Ridge formed when a silica-rich liquid seeped through the ground and settled in air pockets and bubbles and cracks and other little spaces in the claystone. Over a really, really long time it hardened, and now we have opal knobbies or nodules or seams where all of those air bubbles and cracks used to be. But the silica-rich liquid would also seep into cavities that were formed when organisms died and got buried in the claystone. That's how we end up with opalized fossils. The liquid would often completely fill those cavities, so any internal details of the animal or the plant would be completely filled over with solid opal. This usually means that internal details like the inside structure of bones and the contents of seed pods, for example, those details can be lost forever. When we're talking about coprolite, it means that we can't look inside the potential poo to see if it's got plant seeds or fish bones or other traces that would clearly identify what it is. So it just makes it all the more difficult to be sure if a potential coprolite is in fact a hundred million year old turd or not. When people bring you things that they think are coprolites and you think they're not, what are the clues that you're seeing that... Because, you know, we've had so many people bring us things that they think are either coprolites or stomach contents over the years. There's certainly features that would indicate, you know, a definite identification is, is difficult. These are some examples of very likely coprolites that are part of the Australian Opal Centre's collection. One of the main indicators paleontologists have identified these specimens with is that they simply look like they might be faeces. There are certain characteristics that are consistent with poo now that haven't really changed in a hundred million years. A sort of vaguely spiral form is coprolite-like at times. Vaguely cylindrical with a very lumpy surface. Cylindrical shapes, spiral forms, pointed or conical ends, and a rough texture. None of these features are conclusive individually, but when you put them together, they might suggest that a knobby is more than meets the eye. And do you remember the three little spirally ones? Yeah, I certainly do. So we've kind of saved the best for last here. These are three tiny specimens that were brought to the Australian Opal Centre, not as potential coprolites, but as a different kind of fossil altogether. Yeah, and they came in a, with a parcel of gastropods, a snail. But these are definitely not snails. These little coprolites were identified largely by accident when Jenny from the Australian Opal Centre happened across some modern day pigeon droppings on the ground under a tree, which were almost exact matches for the three tiny prehistoric samples. I don't spend enough time looking for pigeon poo. 
But every time I come to your place, I look on the ground in that spot and try to find something similar. Yeah, so pretty definitely very similar to bird poo, pigeon poo in, in particular. Jenny, that you picked up off the off the front driveway, my goodness. Yeah. They're, they're almost identical. There's little pigeons everywhere pooing in lightning rain. So based on the similarity between these three tiny fossils and the modern day pigeon droppings, it seems very likely that these are the remnants of prehistoric bird poo, or if not, they're probably the poo of an animal very similar in size to a pigeon. If you're interested in potential excrement updates in the future, please hit the subscribe button down below because I promise you that as soon as there's more information on these little number twos, I will definitely be making another video about it. This video was made with the support, assistance, patience and good humour of the Australian Opal Centre at Lightning Ridge with special thanks to Dr Elizabeth Smith and to Jenny Brammel. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mind on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are in the description and thank you for watching. <laughs>